So with that, so I'll go and give a quick intro for our speaker. Uh, so David Schreer from Autotest's uh, Building Performance Analysis Group. In terms of his education, um, he got his bachelor's in general studies from the University of Michigan, where he studied um, engineering, uh, history, and arts, and then took a pretty long uh, professional sabbatical, is what we'll, we'll call it, where he worked in the profession, uh, owned a couple companies, and then came back to get his master's of architecture for the University of Berkeley. Um, and I want to touch on some of those business businesses that he's owned through the trajectory of his career because I think it provides some pretty interesting perspective and experience. So the first um, was back in 1993, Roofing by Dave. So uh, David got up close and personal with the materials and methods of the residential and commercial building construction and uh, materials and methods. Um, also was the owner of a, a business called Analytical Design, a consulting firm that specialized in building design, engine analysis, and building automation and sensoring. So getting into the monitoring aspect. Um, is currently a partner for Second Bottom Line um, LLC. So this is a green real estate development and property management company. So it brings that financing side to this overall perspective. Pretty diverse experience. Um, and then also David has had some really great uh, professional experience at various firms. Uh, starting out as an intern at Vanderin Associates, so I imagine that had a pretty big impact on the ecological design trajectory uh, of his career. Also worked as an associate for about three years at Loisos Plus Ubelodi, which is a architecture firm in San Francisco that is probably on the cutting edge of uh, bringing daylight and energy simulation to the practice. So I would really encourage you to check out their website. They're doing fantastic work, high design and high performance. And then um, last but not least, he is the senior software engineer and building performance engineer at Autodesk and has been working on the uh, Revit-centric or integrating daylight analysis within the Revit workflow, which he will um, demo and present for us today. So please help me uh, welcome David to Boise. Thank you. Yeah, is this uh, twerking? All right. Uh, thanks, thanks for the intro. That's um, really, um, so I'm in a mix of uh, great people um, with this lecture series, so I'm really honored to be here. Um, I'm going to talk today. I'm going to talk today about uh, some work we've been doing, integrating uh, daylighting analysis and lighting analysis into Revit. But I'm also going to start out just looking at this, uh, this general way that. Um, Autodesk is looking at integrating uh, an analytical feedback into the architect's design process within Revit, within the, the, the Revit workflow. Um, so just starting out, what, part of our, Autodesk has a, is really dedicated to uh, leveraging cloud services. Uh, so we put a, uh, imp implemented a lot of, uh, of um, architecture in, um, uh, in these cloud services and in taking advantage of cloud services. So we've got a number of uh, simulation tools that uh, do their operations on the cloud, Green Building Studio with energy analysis, uh, rendering for, uh, for visual rendering, and also we're using that for our, our lighting analysis. Uh, we've got a, a huge uh, uh, database of uh, climate data um, that the Revit model can focus around for all of these services. So the idea is to, um, is to have everything working inside Revit, inside the architect's uh, working environment, doing the analysis and the heavy lifting uh, in the cloud so it's not taking up your computer resources. You can continue working in Revit while the analysis is happening, getting that data back into the Revit environment so you could navigate it and, and, um, and use it to uh, influence your uh, feedback in your design process. So um, this is just a diagram that shows some of the things that we're working on um, right now. We've got uh, solar radiation analysis, um, daylighting analysis in the middle there, and um, whole building energy analysis. Uh, and again, the idea is to have, have these results be available in Canvas uh, so you can stay in Revit and uh, stay in your, your primary design environment. Um, one major focus of this is that the, the way we're running these analyses, the way we're translating the model and running the analysis on them is by very intelligent algorithms. Uh, so the process, a lot of the process, a lot of the tedious parts of the process are automated. Uh, that's a, a typical uh, thing you'll see with, with energy modeling, daylighting analysis, is you'll give a, a job to a couple different people and you'll get a couple different results back. Uh, because everybody has their own, it's more of, it, it's as much of an art as it is a, a technology. So by 
creating an automated process, we're going to get consistent results uh, across uh, multi across uh, designers and uh, analysts. And um, and by allowing the designer to be to get involved in the process, we're actually um, making this process more useful for designers to get get feedback more quickly. We're not actually trying to take work away from uh, energy analysts and experts. The common misconception. Um, what, what we often say is uh, we when we're we're talking to um, uh, energy analysts, for instance, we'll ask them how long it takes. What, what the profile of their workday is. And uh, usually it'll be, you know, two-thirds of the day we'll be copying models and building things up and putting materials in and doing all this tedious stuff in a couple hours of actually doing the really uh, nitty-gritty analysis, which is where they're really applying their genius. So we're trying to uh, offload all that tedious stuff onto the, into, the, uh, into the tool so the architect can accomplish that, generate the results, do some of his own analysis, and then collaborate with the, with the experts on uh, on making decisions. Um, we're also, by working in the cloud and, and, gen and developing really fast algorithms, uh, we're making it possible to iterate often so this becomes part of the design process rather than uh, handing off a, an energy model or a daylighting analysis to, to an expert who's got a lot of things on his plate. It's going to take a while to get the analysis done, getting results back a few days or a week or a couple weeks later when it may not be as useful. Make that process uh, turn around in, in less than an hour. Um, an, another benefit of working in the cloud is that uh, all the tools become scalable. So we can do a single room analysis, we can do a, a million, three million square foot building daylight analysis, and the difference in time for doing those two analyses are, you know, maybe five minutes for the uh, for the uh, single room analysis and an hour and a half for the three million square foot building. Uh, so those are within within a scale of, of a person's working day rather than, uh, you know, an hour versus a couple, three weeks. So I wanted to show you, uh, just give you a little, little information about the energy analysis workflows that we've implemented uh, starting last year. And this gives a pretty good se sense of uh, how we're approaching this in general. So. Up until um, up until a couple of years ago, you had to go through this really tedious kind of space or room element based process to create an energy model um, in Revit. It, it, there's tons of problems with it. It couldn't handle a lot of space types. Uh, people would make mistakes without being without understanding that they were making a mistake because you couldn't really see what was going on. Um, it it did translate a Revit model roughly into an energy model. You could run that energy model in the cloud and get results back in the Revit environment. Uh, but it, it really was a, a an engineer's process. It required expertise. Uh, a couple years ago, I think three years ago, now we introduced the conceptual mass elements in Vasari and also in, in Revit. And that was more of a Revit integrated process um, where it was much easier to generate a model, automatically generate floors, glazing percentages, uh, materiality, things like that, send it off uh, for analysis and get the results back in Revit. So much, much closer to an integrated uh, Revit design environment. But still, it was using conceptual masses, which are abstracted representations of the actual Revit model. And um, a lot of people just don't understand how that works. Um, it's, a, it's a real art to simplifying a, a, a building to get a, a relevant energy model that still gives uh, relevant results. Um, the w nice thing about it is that put the energy analysis earlier into the design process, into the concept phase, um, and then uh, the experts could work in uh, the detailed phase later in the design process. It was a lot easier, um, whereas the the later phase work is, is a lot more difficult. But it still it, it doesn't didn't give us this end to end workflow that we're looking for. So in tw Revit 2014, we introduced the building elements model is what we're calling it. It, it, it basically uses a, a technique similar to the way CFD models uh, are built, uh, where you kind of seed the space. Uh, we grow we call these voxels until they find the perimeter of the building. And in that way, we're locating all of the interior, uh, separate interior volumes of an existing Revit model. Uh, so all it requires is that your Revit model is built so that uh, it, it follows the basic 
principles of, of good. Design. It, basically, if it looks bad in a plan or in a section, it's not going to work in um, for energy analysis. But pretty, uh, it's pretty foolproof other than that. Um, so I'll show you what this uh, hap what this does in a second. But basically, the idea is that you can use your existing Revit model, um, click a button, run an energy analysis. You don't have to rebuild the model. You don't have to figure out what to simplify. Um, it, it's just a, a push button operation. And the intelligence is in the algorithm, not in elbow grease or, or years of, um, of experience. So I'll just quickly show you uh, kind of the history of that process. This is, this is the uh, conceptual model. So you can see it's an abstracted model of a, a much bigger building. It kind of looks like the, the actual building design, but not really. Uh, but it does allow a, pretty much a push button process. Um, you can see we've clicked the run energy analysis. It's translating the model, adding windows, materials, default, schedule defaults, all the things that are required for an energy model. Sends it off to Green Building Studio in the cloud and brings the results back into the Revit environment uh, with, a, with a stock set of, uh, of charts. So the, the next part of the process, this is the elemental model. So this is an actual Revit model that an architect would, would be working with. Um, and in this case, again, it's a push button process. Enable the ener energy model uh, initiates this uh, translation process, um, sends it off to the cloud, Green Building Studio, populates it with the defaults in, in a similar way, runs the energy analy analysis, and, uh, and brings it back. And let me just jump on to a um, couple of the details about what this actually produces. Uh, this can this can do anywhere, uh, all the way from beginning to the end of the process. Yeah, from conceptual modeling all the way to full CDs. So it will use um, if you have space objects. So space room objects contain mostly architectural information, labeling and occupancy and things like that. Space objects contain uh, uh, functional information, mechanical information. Um, We'd like to combine those in the future so there's no difference because they're really all information about a room. But if you do have spaces and you do have things defined on that, uh, the new geometry that we're creating will consume that space information and use that in the energy model. So I'm just going to go back. I always have problems with uh, with animations here. But let me just move on to... Um, another cloud service that we have is uh, called rendering for a Revit. Um, and this is a this is another cloud service is accessed with a, a couple buttons in the uh, in the toolbar. Um, this originally started out as a focus for visualization. Um, and the idea was just to have a seamless workflow again from Revit to uh, to visualization and uh, showed information in uh, in a rendering gallery. Um, so this is, a, this is a feature for Revit and also for AutoCAD. Um, basically con consists of a model translator, uploads to the cloud, and then uh, does the rendering. And your renderings are available in a, um, in a render gallery online. So the reason I, I bring this up is because uh, when, when th this was being worked on, uh, we worked with the guy who was writing the algorithm. And the algorithm was created to be fast and predictable and, and accurate. And we realized that, wow, this is actually looks like it's a pretty good physically accurate uh, rendering tool. And of course, illuminance data uh, and luminance data is something that needs to be uh, present in the rendering to get the rendering. So we looked at whether uh, we could expose illuminate, the illuminance data and whether it was actually valid, could be valid for uh, daylighting analysis. Uh, so we expose the luminance setting and um, the particular environment settings that you need to do uh, controlled daylighting analysis um, and produce some, some uh, illuminance renderings. So it's you know, useful in, um, in 3D view to a certain extent, uh, but what we really need to do is, is get some check, it, check how it works for some uh, typical uh, daylighting analysis uh, models. 
So before I go into that, I want to talk about the um, validation work we did on this. Uh, a couple of slides on the sky model and a couple of slides on the uh, actual illuminance results that compared to radiance. Um, so I'm not going to go into this too deeply, but just to show you that this data is available, and if anybody has more questions about it, I can refer you to the, uh, to the reference papers. Um, but we looked at uh, the uh, global horizontal and diffuse horizontal illuminance values from um, all the weather, weather data, um, international weather data, uh, what those values were compared at, at different uh, solar angles, and compared them to the results that we received on a, a flat white plane sitting out uh, in an unimpeded environment. Um, the result, the median results are the red line and the uh, variation in the, the weather data is the uh, red area and the results that we re received in our model um, show, shows in the, uh, the green error bars. And just shows a pretty tight correlation um, for uh, global horizontal and for direct we got a little bit more rain for both for diffuse horizontal due to the way the model is, but it's the general characteristic of the Perez model. Um, so I don't want to go into this data any, any more deeply, but just to show you that the, the sky model has, has been validated. So the next step we needed to do to see if this, was, this engine would be something we wanted to pursue as a daylighting analysis tool is to uh, compare to industry standard radiance rendering. Um, so we worked with uh, uh, Chris Human from Lloyd's the New Below to my old firm, and we had built up a really detailed model of our office there in Alameda, um, and he had started in Revit and then used his own process to translate that out into, into Radiance. Uh, so we used the, his renderings and compared them to the results from our rendering tool, and I apologize for the scales being slightly darker on one, but um, just flipping between the two, we've got some uh, pretty tight correlation. Uh, there's a few differences you'll notice in the distribution of the, the direct light here at the doorway, um, which uh, this is mainly due to the way the algorithm works, which we're, we think is actually more accurate with our tool because we're using, we use the actual thickness of the glass rather than a single plane like, like Radiance does. Um, but this gave us a lot of confidence in the tool. We compared the, the maps of the sky models um, and compared it a, a couple of critical times of the year with the direct sun and also um, with a more diffuse day where there's no direct sun entering the building and, and got very tight correlation. And we were confident to move forward. Uh, we did some point analysis. Uh, you can see here that there, uh, the, the error for the error is generally within about 5 to 10 percent between the, the radiance runs and, and the um, rendering runs from, from our tool. So, uh, so I kind of took this project on and, and with a really small team we just moved forward with using this existing uh, rendering engine to provide, uh, to provide daylighting analysis results. And we started with a, a, one of the more popular Daylighting Analysis Workflows, which is LEED uh, uh, 2009 8.1 credit. Uh, and our goal was to automate that process, make it possible for uh, an architect or anybody with a well-founded Revit model to click a couple buttons and get back relevant results for uh, a LEED analysis. So the process, uh, the, the plugin that we created just adds a couple of tools, uh, a couple buttons to the analysis toolbar. Um, it's a two-step process of running the analysis and generating results. Uh, we're leveraging pretty much existing technology um, in, in Revit, the Revit API, which allows us to uh, algorithmically operate on the building model, uh, change views, translate the model. Uh, change the settings automatically to be the proper settings before we export the model. Um, and the translation tools and the visualization tools. Um, and all it requires is a, is a Revit model. Uh, very simple interface with just a, a couple of selections, uh, no technical setup, uh, just choosing the analysis type, how much of the building you want to analyze, and, and what quality level, what grid distribution. 
Everything else is set automatically, so we've got the, we take the location from the Revit model, um, and we choose, choose the, we download the weather data from, from our climate server, choose the, the correct clear day, clear um, conditions for radiation data, and uh, feed that into the analysis engine. Um, right now, the, this tool is in Autodesk Labs, and it's free until the end of the month. Um, just wanted to turn you on to it now while it's free for another month. We'll be, we'll be charging for it after that, but we'll always have a, a free level of service, which is the same as with the, um, the rendering engine. You can always do a low resolution or a small free analysis to get your model set up and, and then pay for something that you might end up charging your customers for, like a lead analysis. So by working in the in the Revit environment, we're able to basically let, you know use all of the tools that exist in Revit uh, to make a full presentation, to uh, to analyze the building and operate on the building and make changes. So these are all things that are, are assets that are created with the with the tool in Revit. Um, so we create floor plans, uh, 3D. Uh, 3D model and uh, the schedule needed to submit the lead analysis. And here's a layout I created just as an example of how um, the presentation could could complete. So um, I wanted to do a, a live demo uh, next to just show some of the how this might work. So this is a model we got from a a customer and um, he's allowed us to use this uh, publicly. It's just a, a nice model. It takes about uh, five or ten minutes to run the analysis. So I'm going to kick off the analysis while we get going. I have a I have a model that's I've already gotten results for, but I wanted to show you the whole process. Um, so the process is simply clicking the run analysis button. What it's doing right now is uh, looking up the weather data for the location of the Revit project. Um, and it's calling that from the Green Building Studio climate server. Um, once it gets that data, uh, now it's got that data and it's chosen the, uh, the data for the September 21st at 9 and 3 p.m. for a clear sky. We've just got the lead analysis option right now. Everything else is all set, so I'm just going to uh, click start analysis. And then, uh, and then I'm done. So now the, the model is being translated into a format that the analysis engine can understand. It's uploaded to the cloud, and now the analysis is running. Uh, so now I'm free to just continue working, uh, doing, doing whatever uh, I normally do while I'm waiting for the, for the analysis to complete. Um, and I'm able to check the status of the analysis by clicking Run Analysis again. So I'll move to a model that has, we've already gotten results on. When you get the results, when you get a notification that the results are complete, uh, the generate results button will, the results you get back are a, a grid of points uh, that covers all the, uh, 30 inches above all the floor objects in the Revit model. Uh, and those are stored with your Revit model. So once you do the analysis, you can get that back, you can save your Revit model, and you can always go back and, and look at that data, operate on it, visualize it in different ways uh, without having to, to run the analysis again. Uh, the, the first screen shows us the, the lead summary. This one is obviously not passing, so we've got a little work to do on it. Um, in a 3D view, it'll generate uh, points on the entire floor surface. So this model is actually uses a floor object for outside services as well. Um, and so those services are analyzed even though, even though those are not part of the lead process. Um, but in the, uh, in the floor plan view, we also generate a floor plan view that, that uses only rooms that we've defined as, as lead regularly occupied rooms. And, and those are simple room parameters that we can define in the, in the floor schedule. So these are the rooms that are, are used in the, the lead percentage calculations. And as a design tool, um, Obviously, having these results drawn in the model, uh, we don't need to look at points on a piece of paper and compare them to the model, see where the point lines up with the model. 
They're actually here present in the model. Um, right now we've got two times available so we can switch between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. and look at the uh, different performance of the building at those two different times. And then finally, um, the two schedules are generated, uh, one room schedule where we can define which rooms are included in daylighting. And if I want to, for instance, include uh, some other rooms in the daylighting, I can recalculate my results based on this new settings without having to resubmit the model for another analysis. I can just click generate results again and now these two rooms uh, should be included in the analysis. So the points that it's operating on, we generate a, at higher resolution, we generate a three inch, uh, three inch grid of points, so a very detailed grid of points. Um, and we visualize them at, at one inch, uh, at one foot um, in the model. And that's just to get, to make sure that the, you get a pretty fast turnaround. So you can see here, I've turned these on and now these are showing the percent within threshold, above threshold, and below threshold for, for lead performance. Um, and then I don't know how familiar you are with lead 8.1, but if, uh, if, you had, if you specify that you have automated shades on the building, uh, you can ignore the above threshold areas. So you can see this area has got a, a lot of area that's above 500 foot candles, so a lot of direct light coming in on the, on the critical day. So if I include uh, automated shades in that and recalc, this area should now turn to zero. And I've actually got much better performance. I can see that my, my lead performance is really degraded in, in large part from uh, direct sun penetration. So before I leave this section, anybody have any questions? You want to see any other ways? Yeah. Um, earlier when I asked about the phase of the phase of the phase Yeah, right. Could you repeat the question? Sure, yeah. Um, so the question was whether uh, there was a previous question about room and space objects, and I mentioned that we use space object data to populate the energy model. And here we're using uh, room data to populate the daylighting model. So the, the idea here, like I, we would like to coordinate these. So right now there is a disconnect, and you would need two if you wanted to put detailed data into your energy model. Uh, we decided to use rooms in this case because it's more of an architect's tool. Uh, and architects would typically define rooms just to have labels and, and area takeoffs. Uh, yeah, yeah, basically. I mean, you could you could number spaces the same as rooms, but yeah, the the, the room information, the the value of the uh, area of the rooms is is what leads on once. For luminance. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, actually, uh, so let me show you one of those, actually. Um, hold on here, let me walk through that process real quick. So in, this is a, the rendering tool is a visualization tool. So instead of being on the analysis toolbar, it's on the view toolbar. Um, but we do, have, we do have the option to generate analytical results using the illuminance setting. So this is the dialog. Um, I've set up a couple 3D views that are uh, floor plans. So I basically set up an orthographic camera facing down that's inside the roof of the building. Uh, so I can generate a similar, uh, a similar rendering as the, uh, as the lead tool. So I can select a luminance. Um, now I've set up that 3D view the rendering settings to have the time, the proper time. So I can just going to use the date and time from the view. Uh, currently, the the you can choose a number of sky models, including the daylight factor. Um, currently, the direct normal and diffuse horizontal you have to look up from a weather file and enter it manually. It's not looked up automatically uh, in this tool. So this is kind of more more of an advanced tool. And then, of course, you can set your legend setting, and then start rendering. I'm going to just go to the <clears throat> rendering galley because I've already so now the analysis that I kicked off about 
10 minutes ago when I started the demo is now that's complete. So it gives you a sense of how long it takes to get results back for a model that size. So here's the render gallery, and this is an image of that uh, that camera view uh, facing down. I've done a little trick here where I put in a, a plane that I uh, uh, made 100% cut out so it wouldn't affect the light levels in the space, but it does receive illuminance uh, information at, at 30 inches above the floor. So one thing that Radiance does that's different than what we do is radi in glazed surfaces, Radiance will make them transparent, and all other surfaces it will show the amount of light falling on them. And that's just a visualization trick. Uh, uh, so what we do is we just show how much light is hitting each surface, even if it's a glass surface. Uh, so if, if you do an illuminance rendering of a highly glazed building, you won't see through the glass anymore. You'll see how much light is hitting that glass. So in this case, we use that trick to uh, put a plane running through the whole whole space. And even though that plane is completely transparent and doesn't affect the, the light qualities in the space, it'll still show the illuminance values on it. David, we got a, a question, question online, online that I wanted to throw your, your way. way. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, so Mary Wurst asks, asks, do the walls of those, those rooms, rooms need to be in the model, model that you're running, running the analysis, analysis in? Or can, or can you be in a model, model that links, links in these elements and still run the analysis? analysis. Uh, she's an engineer that typically links into the architecture models. models. So they have to own that, or, or can do it remotely? Right, that's a great question. Um, so the, currently, the only limitations are that the floor objects um, have to be part of the native model. And that's because the, of the data structure in Revit. We're using the floor objects to store the points data. Um, we are working on an upgrade because this, is be this has been a problem with other users uh, in, in during the lab period where we're instead of using the floor objects, we're using a data table to store the analysis points. So we should be able to use floors in linked models. Um, but one thing you can do is just trace over the floor because you just need the floor surface uh, to have your analysis surface. And then all the other characteristics of the linked model will actually affect the lighting qualities of the space. So the rendering tool uh, respects all of the link models. Um, it's just that we need a floor object to create a, a data analysis plan. Yep. Uh -huh. You can pretty much repeat the question, David. I, sorry, did you repeat oh, the question? Sorry, yeah. uh, the question was whether the plane that I was uh, talking about using here to uh, reflect the illuminance values was a reference plane or was it something else? Right. I just use a ceiling object. I, it doesn't really matter what it is. Um, I, yeah, it's got to be a physical. Yeah, a, a reference plane wouldn't do it. So, Because what we're doing is we're actually putting an object in there that we want to, uh, we want to show where we want to reference the illuminance. And you're only going to see that on an actual object, not on a reference plane. Yeah, let me actually see if I can dig up a couple of. And Dave, could you repeat that question? Sorry. Yeah, uh, the question was. <laughs> thanks for a reminder. I'm glad you're there. Um, the question was, what, can we set up a uh, a camera view for? So, uh, oh, are you talking? Uh, you're saying to to get to get, to get luminance. Yeah, so, right, we haven't exposed luminance yet. It's, of course, part of the what's generated during the process of creating a rendering, but we haven't exposed that yet. Yeah. But I'll mark that down as another request. And then, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, material types for glazing, um, so like non standard um, items, maybe a cow wall, mm -hmm. or, and then go really far and see it again. Yeah. But what, how much support is there for? Non, just clear glazing. Right, right. So the question was, uh, uh, what kind of glazing are we supporting? What kind of transparent or translucent services are we supporting? So currently, we're, uh, we just have clear. We just uh, can do clear and tinted glazing. We can't do any complex services. Um, I'll take that as another request for diffuse. Yeah, we, we're running into, there's a, a ton of implement, there's a ton of uses. There's a ton of times we run into models with diffuse glazing. I mean, skylights are pretty much all diffuse. So. 
that's that's a high priority item that we need to meet very soon. Um, and BSDF serves something we could do in the future also, but it's, it's generally the way we work at a company like Autodesk is to hear questions like you're asking right now, get uh, get um, requests from customers, and the highest priority ones will be done first. Uh, so send your questions my way and send your requests my way. I'd, uh, translucent glazing is one of our highest priorities right now. Yeah. Uh, we do support things like uh, son solar tubes uh, because the only way those can be really be modeled is with the uh, IES lighting, lighting file. So we do support that. Any other questions about the presentation? Okay, so um, so just to, before I get off of this piece, um, these both use the same engine. That push button lead analysis tool uh, does the job of generating an analysis grid and bringing the data back into Revit. Um, this the rendering tool with the illuminance setting uses the same engine, so you'll get similar results if you trick it into giving it, uh, giving it to you on a 30-inch plane. But generally, this tool is not going to be as useful for, uh, for design work because it's not, you're not you, you can't import that back into the model. You've got to do a lot of work to uh, get results on the, on, um, on the analysis plane. So, um, so that's why we've created the, the lead analysis tool. Uh, so I have some other information about how the uh, how the algorithm works now this is this is a, a different algorithm from what radiance uses um, one of the one of the main drawbacks with radiance is that it's uh, it, it takes a while to get the uh, get the results back um, and to make a cloud rendering solution that we're gonna that we're gonna have a controllable cost for on our end and be able to um, ask a reasonable price for that that is consistent over time we don't it's not going to have you know it's not going to require that the user do special things to make it cheap or expensive um, we needed a tool that works in a, in a really in a different way rather than tracking all the all the light sources coming into the building we need um, we need a tool that is more predictable um, so we base this tool on something called multi-dimensional light cuts, and um, you guys can read about that. There's a number of papers out there. Um, I'll go into the part that kind of makes this tool fast and, um, and to work predictably on all kinds of different models and what the benefits of that are. Uh, so what it's called is a, a many lights algorithm. Um, I'm not the guy who wrote this, so uh, bear with me, and uh, I can direct you to much more technical questions, but I'll try to give you my best interpretation of it as I understand it. So one of the problems that you have to overcome when you want to be able to have, allow people to work in the Revit environment without having to like you know export some data out, do special stuff with it to run an analysis, is that we may want to do a rendering of a small space on a very very big building. I mean I've worked with plenty of models that have a context of all of the whole all of downtown New York, for instance, um, and we want to be able people to be able to do a rendering on one room without having to take apart the model and extract that one room. So what the uh, so there's a solution called virtual point light targeting. Um, what this does is it takes the uh, the room that the the scene that you're interested in, and instead of uh, reflecting all the light that is available from light sources outside and inside, it actually uh, generates uh, point light uh, sources at the boundary to the envelope of the area that you're analyzing. So it does an initial pass to uh, make a model of the light that is actually meeting that space that you're interested in. And then it throws away all those lights outside and models, models the space using, uh, uh, using many lights, multiple lights. So the way this is done is it basically takes your point of view, um, looks around the, the space to determine um, what areas are most important does a second pass for um, the light source, and um, and determines and basically builds this model of the many lights um, with uh, with levels of importance and locations based on your actual viewpoint. And the big thing to to understand about this is that you don't have to you can 
basically do a small space rendering that is just as efficient on a very, very large model as doing the whole model all at once. All that matters is your, the number of points you're analyzing or the resolution of your, of your rendering. And that goes for both you know, visual renderings and um, uh, daylight analysis. So uh, I think I'm going to skip over this pretty quickly, but these are some of the benefits of, uh, of this many lights algorithm and this special targeting and weighting factor. As you can see in this, in this area, you've got some kind of weird artifacts. Um, and this is without targeting, targeting meaning uh, weighting factors on, on the lights. Um, adding, adding targeting basically gets rid of those, smooths out the, the services, does a much better model of the lights that are actually important. Um, so the, the general advantage of the many lights algorithm then is that it's very, very fast performance. Uh, we have to do many fewer bounces because we're only doing the bounces that actually matter. Uh, we're only considering the light that actually matters. Um, we're not, it's less of a brute force method. Uh, we can actually use it on what we call design size models. So the whole model, you don't have to uh, cut out pieces of the model. Um, the, the render setup is automatic, meaning instead of having to change a bunch of settings to, uh, to manage your trade-offs between quality and speed, uh, you can just let it go because the algorithm itself is the thing that helps manage, uh, manage that, that trade-off between quality and speed. Yeah? That's that's how I understand it. I yeah, um, I'm not the guy to answer it more technically than that. But that's when when I've been working with the last few months. That's that's how I understood it. It's basically like, like similar to a BSVF. Yeah. Um, so yeah, since since the the analysis time depends on your resolution or your number of points, it's a it's a much more predictable cost. You don't it, it, it doesn't matter how many lights you have in there, how big your model model is. It's just the quality of, of, of what you want, um, and also. It, we can get a high quality preview. And let me show you a couple of these things. Um, these are just a couple examples. The, the many lights rendering um, compared to path tracing. Uh, these are, uh, the path tracing is run twice as long and uh, you can see that the quality comparison uh, on those, the many lights is much better. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, design size models, you don't have to throw out part of your, part of your model to be able to render a, a uh, particular space. Um, this is an example of the, the time it takes to run these. Uh, the, the clip, the, we've clipped the model to just include the room you're interested in, um, and it's only 25% faster than if we use the entire model. Um, similar with uh, many, uh, many electric lights, uh, there's not much difference in speed with uh, the lights in the entire model still included or, the, or clipping out the lights that aren't, aren't used. Uh, I'm going to pass by this. So um, automatic rendering, this is what I mentioned. These are the settings in 3D Studio Max for lighting analysis, for rendering. It's just absurd. And 90% of these, 90% um, of these are really to trade off quality and speed. Um, and, you know, most of the stuff is just not, not required with the many lights algorithm. Um, do, 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 do. So let's skip that. Uh, so this is one slide I really appreciated um, when it was shown to me is that with path tracing, which I, is what Radiance uses, um, as as the rendering is progressing, it's basically finding all the light that's available, all the all the all the additional bounces are are, are finding all the light and kind of building up the light on the surfaces. Um, the 360 renderer gives a pretty good distribution of the light right from the beginning and then resolves it more um, as the renderer goes on. So even if you do a very quick preview, you're going to get a pretty good general view of the overall distribution of light in the scene. And then the longer you run it, the better resolution you can get, for instance, um, in a very bright area or in a darker area, you're going to get better um, resolution of the different light qualities there. 
Uh, but overall, if you, st if you stop a path tracer earlier, early, you're going to get incorrect results, whereas that's not as much of the case with, um, with the Autodesk render. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm actually not. I'm not really familiar with how how well that one uh, how that one works. Uh, well, the way it was described to me, path tracer is basically the way radiance uh, radiance works, the ray tracing. Okay. Um, so I think that, that's all I had for the presentation. Um, yeah, I got a quick yeah. question. Um, can you show us in the model how you apply surface reflectances and um, BLT settings for Windows? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so this is this is an area of um, one of our areas of concern. <laughs> uh, it's a definitely burdensome right now to set materials in the Revit model. So um, feel free to give us feedback on that. Uh, currently. The, the rendering tool uh, started out as a visual, uh, a visual rendering tool. So the way the materials were uh, set up and described was from a perspective of somebody who's trying to set up what something looks like, um, you know, with color and texture, and, and rather than from an analytical perspective. So from analytical, for an analytical model, all we really need, need to know is T-Viz, maybe, maybe diffusivity, uh, BSDF or something, and reflectivity. We just need really specific analytical values. And those values are, are difficult to access uh, through the, the current materials editor. So my, my process in general is to either use the, the manage materials toolbar or to select a piece of glazing itself and, uh, and edit that. The information I need to know about the glass is the thickness of the glass because, um, as I mentioned, the, our tool actually uses the uh, effects of glass thickness uh, in the model rather than using a, a single plane. Um, and then define the material using the material editor. So this is, this is something that's fairly common uh, with Revit is that over time, as new tools are added to Revit, new ways of defining things are added as well. Uh, and oftentimes, there appears to be a conflict or a contradiction between them. And that is definitely the case uh, here. So, what we're the where we are the where we're getting the data for the uh, uh, TVs and the reflectivity of services in the appearance tab of the material. And it's simply the uh, color of the glazing. So if I set the color of the glazing, um, RGB values, it's basically uh, roughly equivalent to a percent uh, uh, percent TVs. Now, it's, it's a pretty complicated formula um, to translate the RGB values to the actual TVs. So we provided a table uh, on, in the help documentation to help this translation, here's an image of that appearance tab. And we provided a table here that uh, where you enter with the thickness of the glass. And here we had one inch glass or 24 and a half millimeter. And let's say we want 60% glazing. I'm going to need an RGB that's 109, 109, 109. So that's what I'm going to enter here. So now I've got. 60% transmissive glass. Yeah, so reflectance is a similar uh, similar process. I'm just going to choose this one because it's easier to access. Um, same thing. Uh, m most opaque services are, are uh, structural services, so we want to go into the structure and define the finish layer. So here the finish layer is gypsum wallboard. And again, the appearance tab. And here I've got uh, concrete, and I can enter the RGB values here. Now the RGB values for uh, opaque materials are a little bit simpler to define. Um, they use 
here's a table we've provided, but it's basically this distribution, this formula, you can figure out the, um, the reflectance of the, of the surface. And I'm Yeah, currently we just use a default 4% reflectivity off the of glass, right? The question is whether we can control reflectivity off the glass, and yeah, currently we're just at a default 4%. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so sure. Do you get pixel point um, luminance values when you get the rendering? So I can, you could click on one and say that's right. uh, 200 candelas meter squared. Or yeah, cu currently we don't in the renderings. Um, in in the the lead tool, you can uh, you can actually look at the individual points. Yeah. Uh, so you can look at the individual points themselves. We haven't we haven't enabled HDR export. Okay. Yet that's just something that our on our roadmap. Excellent. So, formally enter our question and answer um, portion of our uh, presentation and demo. So, if you have a question, go and raise your hand. I'll travel around with the mic and we'll start off with another one of our online questions, which was essentially what is the fate of Ecotech? Oh, what is the fate of Ecotech? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we hear that a lot. Um, so, it's, it's, Available education. Um, I I don't know how long it's to be around. I'm not really the guy in, in charge of that. Um, what I can say is that we definitely hear everybody asking for the tools that are the features that are available in Ecotech to be to be continue to be available. Um, and uh, just to, to everybody out there, I mean, anybody who wants to give us more feedback about it, we we really listen to that. There's a lot of pressure for us to continue to implement Ecotech-like functionality in uh, in Revit and Vasari. Um, so I can't tell you if it's going to be killed or not because I'm not in charge of that. But we're we don't want to lose the functionality that's in Ecotech. And the more you guys ask for that functionality, the the higher that will be on the, our priority list. All right. Any other questions? Here's another one from Gunnar. An off topic on from the daylight, but when you're doing the energy modeling portion of it, uh -huh. uh, I guess maybe that's somebody else that's coming out, but um, is that beyond just the, the Green Building Studio support that gives the quick results, uh -huh. is it either in the works or currently available to do, like, to actually have the full engineering analysis for out of Revit using the same pathway and getting, at, getting back your 90.1 Appendix G modeling right. results? So generally, we're we're not. Uh, it's not a high priority as to, to pursue all these regulatory things as a regu making yeah. regu regulatory compliance tools. Uh, but we do want to make it possible to for people to do regulatory compliance. So for people to, to either get it out make tools. To the, so one, to well, the one thing you software. can do is you can export the the energy model and and open it up in Equest. So we do export an IMP model. Um, so and that's a common workflow that people use the space based method uh, a lot of engineers use that to create their uh, their initial eQuest model from from the Revit model are they also going to support or move to also doing IDF for energy plus well we already we already yeah. have an IDF export okay. so and the IDF export is we haven't gotten into uh, part into validating it very well but uh, the geometry is is valid it's an easy export so you can, you can definitely currently use uh, Revit to generate Geometry for IDF plus all the basic. And know, it's mostly all the material definition pieces. That yeah, the material it, definitions, the schedules. Up. I mean, it'll yeah. run. The the yeah. analysis yeah. will run. Uh, everything goes through everything goes through GBXML, but you can basically export an IDF directly. Yeah, and I mean, I don't know if any a lot of you know, but this is pretty public that Autodesk has refactored the Energy Plus code from Fortran into C plus uh, plus. So we're highly invested in uh, in Energy Plus for sure. <clears throat> Any other questions out there from our audience? Uh, another one from the online uh, crew. 
was uh, if there was going to be a new version when lead version 4 comes out and uh, to incorporate some of the annual uh, metrics uh, analyses pathways. Right, great. Yeah, we hear that loud and clear too, and that's one of my one of my babies is I definitely want to get SBA and uh, AS, ASF or ASR um, in there. Uh, so lead, lead version 4 is a fairly easy thing. It's just different thresholds, so um, we're hoping to get that in there right away, and we're, we'll definitely be working on SBA. Any thoughts on what the daylight analysis would cost after this book? Uh, it's, yeah, we've got so I, I haven't gotten the, the costing totally approved yet, but um, so I can't really talk about it. But we, we definitely want everybody to be able to do a, a free level uh, of a room or a small building um, or a lower resolution of a, of a, you know, a building like this size. Um, and and you know our our goal is to keep it cheap enough that you can do a lot of iterations. So we've we don't want just the people who are doing lead analysis now to be able to and charging two thousand five thousand bucks for it to be able to do it. We want to really open this up to everybody. So you know the goal is for it to be you know a hundred times cheaper at least. Any other questions? Yeah, all right. Well, we will leave it at that. Uh, let's all thank David for presenting for us today. Thank you. And then uh, there were many 